Okay, uh, good afternoon, good day, dear viewers. Welcome uh, and hello to everyone. Welcome to the eighth virtual seminar on applied economics and policy analysis in Central Asia. I'm your moderator, Bahram Kasimov. Uh, today, we're privileged to have two great speakers uh, based out of Germany and the US, but uh, born in Pakistan. Uh, the, our speaker is uh, Dr. Nader Janibekov. So thank you very much for uh, agreeing to make this presentation today. Dr. J uh, Nader Janibekov uh, joined, he, he's, uh, he works at IAMO since August 22, uh, 2012 as a researcher in the Department of Agriculture Policy. He obtained his PhD at the Center for Development Research uh, from the University of Bonn. Germany. So uh, he probably doesn't need more introduction uh, to our viewers. Uh, our discussant is Dr. Komjan Akramov. Uh, he is a senior research fellow at Development Strategy and Governance Dis Dis Division at uh, International Food Policy Research Institute uh, based out of Washington, D.C. Uh, Dr. Akramov was a doctor fellow at Rand Graduate School where he received his Ph.D. And he probably also doesn't need more introduction uh, among our viewers. They're both well-known, well-published uh, on agricultural policy topics in Uzbekistan, Central Asia, and beyond. So thank you very much to both of you for agreeing and for helping me organize these uh, virtual seminars. So uh, without further ado, uh, over to you, uh, Nadir. Assalamu alaikum, Bahram. Thank you, Bahram, for a nice introduction. Assalamu alaikum, Kamal Janaka. Thanks for discussing my presentation today. Uh, dear listeners, dear viewers, auditor, thanks for joining the session. And I hope you, you, you take some home messages also from next one hour. So I will structure my presentation today around the topic which has been inspiring me for a while. So it's about behavioral insights, yeah, and how it can be, these insights can guide policymakers, yeah, how they can benefit from this kind of behavioral studies. So I conducted this study and it's still ongoing work. So it's a piece we are currently presenting with my colleagues at IAMO, Abdul Samay Tajiv, Zafar Kurbanov. And also it's a, from long standing cooperation with Iroda Amirova and Martin Petrik. So Iroda Amirova from Westminster and Martin Petrik from Gießen University. So let's go to the slide on the outline. So first I will briefly introduce you on the why we talk about behavioral factors, why not our classical, you know, economic, rational, self-interested individuum, yeah, why we talk about behavioral agent. And then we talk about, yeah, I, I'll drive you to the problem of social dilemma. That's a big issue for yeah, Central Asia, especially for, particularly for irrigated areas of Central Asia, where this collective action, you know, cooperation among farmers, especially voluntarily one, is still yeah, wishes to be developed. So then I derive research questions and then go to the introduction, yeah, a bit of description of what we observe in two study settings, contrasting study settings. And then I talk about model results and then drive some policy implications from them. Okay, so what we traditionally know, that's what, economists have been um, studying and then policymakers basically use it as a uh, center for deriving policies. It's that, um, yeah, we, we talk about homo economicus here. It's a selfish, rational actor, you know, which basically uh, drives his action with, in certain direction like profit maximization, yeah? And then usually these policymakers use these models to target certain ambitious policy ambitions like improving crop yields, expanding exports, increasing employment in agriculture, or also in water management, improving individual contributions to irrigation infrastructure, for instance. So for instance, these assumptions of homo economicus basically imply something like, yeah, if there is necessary organizations or institutions which can make cooperation attractive or economically beneficial than non-cooperation, then people would cooperate, yeah? Or let's talk about sustainable agricultural technologies, yeah, practices, for instance, conservation agriculture. Conservation agricultural technologies will be adopted by farmers if they 
more pr produce more economic benefits than conventional uh, deep plow technologies. Yeah, for instance, or for instance, another thing: it's large farms can utilize economies of scale and then increase the uh, investments into modern technologies. Yeah, so that's kind of classical uh, economic assumptions. And usually, this kind of yeah, that's existed for many years, decades, centuries. That rationality assumptions always prove to be statistically valid. Yeah. So if you observe lots of patterns of decision making in um, among individuals, among farmers, for instance, we you confirm this rationality assumption. And then based on this kind of economic models, usually policymakers they come up with some certain mandates or bans. Yeah. So uh, limiting, restricting upper or lower levels of certain activities or providing or changing the economic incentives yeah for instance by subsidies or taxes yeah it's also monetary uh, we talk about monetary instruments to affect the behavioral decision maker but recently many scholars have been approaching this problem by telling that well that's this economic rationale can be also complemented yeah fine-tuned enriched by if researchers can consider behavioral factors yeah so that's basically this kind of behavioral factors became especially important in targeting the social dilemma issues yeah for instance in this case in my presentation I will, I will talk about collective action in irrigation water management but let's take it more urging more problematic issues it's like how to make people cooperate and comply to reduce the coronavirus transmission yeah that following um uh certain rules yeah so this behavioral factors also make a strong reference to the fact and that's what we also observe that individuals usually influenced or reflect on the opinion of others from their social circles yeah so they do what other things right things to do yeah so it's not necessarily profit it cannot be maximizing the benefits economic benefits but it's still kind of right things to do yeah so this kind of behavioral factors basically they utilize non-financial characteristics of decision making yeah of decision choice and then basically it's an argument that in future and it's already you can observe in many publications appearing for instance on farmers participation in environmental programs that this kind of approach should be hybrid yeah it's a mix between classical economic theory and then behavioral economics so what i will try to develop here it's about in this presentation it's importance of social norms i put pictures here which probably also signal the traditional social norms of central asian communities yeah? kazakhstan uzbekistan for instance so it's basically people try to follow and listen observe by observing the general accepted behavior yeah, among their circles among their society and these individual decisions usually influenced by interpersonal relationships yeah it's not that person does calculates its own decision choice but it's basically reflects what others are doing or others are thinking yeah so we talk about this perceived societal pressures that people can disapprove certain behavior or kind of put even sanctions yeah stop talking to this person if person engage in some non social antisocial behavior yeah so for instance classical example which you could observe in in the emerging now emerging literature it's for instance this behavioral insights which contribute to the understanding of farmers participation in different environmental programs it's a studies from Western Europe, yeah. So there you see that many studies tell that uh, farmers who participate in such environmental programs, they are more likely to be more concerned about their relatives, friends, yeah, neighbors, than people who are do not participate in such uh, studies, yeah, in such programs, in such environmental programs. And that's basically it's not only about profit maximizing. There are farmers who adopt certain technologies to improve their social status yeah so public visibility public image so they would adopt 
certain modern technology just to be, you know, or they will comply to certain environmental program to be associated, to be labeled or have this status, yeah? So it's basically they also would engage in such programs to signal that they have pro-social behavior, yeah? So relevance to Central Asia, first of all, from Central Asia, from post-Soviet five Central Asian countries, we know that Central Asian community have been for many years under Soviet regime, yeah? So it was very long traditionally under the several centuries, 70, uh, several uh, decades, 70 years under centrally planned economy. And then since 90s, there is efforts to transit, to transfer this economy, political system into democratic market uh, based economy yeah? in, by introducing certain institutions. So here still in this process, these traditions yeah, like yeah, social norms became quite strong. Yeah? So this, we talk about how people assess or perceive this kind of social norms. And then also the social norms can be uh, enriched or complemented by farmers or individuals assessment of perceptions about, uh, for instance, a new institutions being introduced like land tenure, yeah? land lease certificates, or for instance, whether the role of authority ha has changed, whereas the authority is intervening into the decision making or providing more freedom to the farmers, yeah? or the authority is trustful, yeah? if the individuals can now trust to local authority. So this kind of factors have direct impact on decision choice by farmers and then I will try to discuss it later. So let's go back to the social dilemma issue. Yeah, it's a quite strong uh, uh, kind of a problem uh, in, in irrigated areas of Central Asia where previously centralized coordinated uh, approach to allocate, distribute water and finance the smaller canals have been substituted by uh, farmers, by new organizations, which were based on the farmers' voluntarily contributions in terms of their labor efforts and also in the monetary uh, fees, yeah, monetary contributions. So the main problem here is that individuals usually tend free ride. They put in the short term benefits higher than public benefits and then try to free ride on efforts of others. So three papers which study this using economic, uh, economic uh, rigor was to mention. It's first by Rosner and Zikas who basically confirms that the trust is very crucial factor to, to uh, which determines the people compliance to the agreed rules and also to cooperate yeah, in water management. So it's, they talk about the self-governed systems. Another study by Amirova, Yoroda Amirova and co-authors basically looks how communication among farmers is very important, yeah, so that it can improve cooperation, but also that penalties, yeah, monetary penalties, sanctions can basically disincentivize uh, farmers to cooperate. Uh, paper by Ahmad Hamidov is also looks at that direction, but basically links the strong authority or management of these organizations, which drive the collective actions. Yeah, importance of this top-down promotion of coordinations makes it very strong and important, and it should be uh, adapted to the local settings. Yeah, that's what he says. So from this, we can we we'll, we we'll look at this, this from the stake. We take look at the three. Uh, problems, three research questions which we try to answer, uh, taking this environment, participation in environmental programs, whether farmers who have higher concerns about their society opinions are more likely to cooperate in water management. Yeah, and then whether the opinion of farmer, uh, whether concerns of farmer in, in authority's opinion, yeah, whether he values the opinion of local authority contributes also to the decision farmer to cooperate, to participate in voluntarily in water management. And also whether the reputation of water supply organization is important to promote 
yeah, voluntarily water cooperation. So we try to answer these questions. We study these questions through yeah, um, farm survey data, which was conducted in last year in March, April, 2019, among farmers in Turkestan province, yeah, former South Kazakhstan province in Kazakhstan, where we interviewed 502 farmers, and also in Samarkand province in Uzbekistan, where 460 farmers were interviewed. And the data collection was conducted within AgriChange project funded by Volkswagen Stiftung, and then studies now still being conducted, uh, being done under the new society pro program, doctoral program funded also by. So this is two research settings. This is Maktaral, where farmers basically traditionally focus on cotton cultivation. And then we have the Samarkand Oasis where we also conducted interviews. So why it's important to, to study? Why we selected this cross-country comparative approach? Yeah, Why we think that we put Kazakhstan farmers against Uzbekistan farmers yeah, in understanding this water management cooperation? So first of all, let's yeah, acknowledge there in terms of traditions, cultures, religion, these two irrigated air populations and these two irrigated areas are very close to each other. Yeah. But in terms of agricultural reforms, institutional reforms, which were taken since 1960s, there is some divergence. Yeah? There is some differences. So for instance, we, uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Roda Miro, Martin Petrik, and then updated by Abdul Samet Tajiv, basically summarizes five uh, areas where the differences are more or less visible, yeah? which is also important for the study. For instance, land tenure, yeah? land lease system, land tenure, in Kazakhstan, there is farmers can receive land as a private property and also engage into the subleasing activities. Yeah, in Uzbekistan, it's mostly we talk about long lease for or um, land use rights. Yeah, and mostly land is allocated under strategic crops. Yeah, farm restructuring. Kazakhstan, we experience experienced um, big reforms where land was. In southern areas, we talk about Turkestan region, the farm average size is about six hectare, yeah? very small farmers. While in Uzbekistan, the reforms can be also characterized as nonlinear. Yeah? We have farm fragmentation and then op several waves of optimization program to increase the size of a farm, especially in uh, cotton and wheat cultivating farmers. And also we have a new form of organizations being introduced recently it's a cotton textile clusters or uh, horticultural cooperatives. Yeah, land distribu distribution process also varied. Yeah, that land was in Kazakhstan mostly given to f farm members. Yeah, and but in Uzbekistan that was done in the form of auctions, so people could participate and uh, bet by certain property characteristics. Yeah, to receive this land. Yeah like farming skills, education uh, assets. Yeah, strategic role of agriculture. Yeah, we have uh, crop production. Kazakhstan is mostly in market economy, uh, lots of subsidies being diverted to that sector. In Uzbekistan, un until recently, until March of this year, December last year, cotton and wheat played very strategic position. Yeah, there were dominant crops and mostly state mandated uh, under delivery quotas, yeah. There's under press, price control until recently, that was the truth. Now it's the situation has been changing. And also the access to capital was like in Kazakhstan, that was a lot of private banks serving to, uh, to farmers or uh, companies, processing companies. And also uh, you see a lot, very strong participation of farmers in contract farming, yeah? Where inputs and services being partly provided by processors, yeah? Uh, in Uzbekistan settings until recently still was monopolized input channels. So what we think, just to clarify this again, water management is a social dilemma. We talk about this public good dilemma and common resource dilemma, yeah, commons dilemma, and in a hybrid, as a hybrid social dilemma. So it's a bit of public good dilemma and common Good dilemma. So where we say that farmers not only extract and follow the distribution rules, which they agreed with the farmers, but also they are required, expected to make a contribution 
to the irrigation infrastructure which is surrounding their area. So where all other water users, not only farmers, but also small scale households basically depend on, yeah? So we have here give social dilemma, yeah? So it's farmers expected to contribute to the infrastructure maintenance and for them, their yeah, choice would be not to contribute, to free ride on others' contribution. And then take some dilemma where farmers would free ride, yeah, extract the goods, the water resources to their fields, and then basically damage the other water users. So for instance, what, what agri-change data tells us, yeah, which we collected in 2019 with this give some water management. Yeah? So there we see, for instance, that a lot of farmers in Kazakhstan and half, almost half of the farmers in Uzbekistan responded that they don't participate in any sort of voluntarily contribution, yeah? uh, cooperation in this case. So they don't engage in contributing, but even if they, they contribute, for instance, 50% in Uzbekistan, a larger share of these contributions come as an informal way. Yeah? So it's informal agreements of farmers with their neighbors, with, within their society, within their hydrological bar, uh, boundaries to contribute yeah? when there, it's expected. For instance, in maintaining, cleaning irrigation canal, in buying a new pump, a re repairing pump. And then we have, for instance, what is the difference between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan settings in addition is that in Kazakhstan, farmers also reported that they have some sort of a formal agreement among farmers to cooperate, documented via the water management agencies. Yeah, this yellow. While in Uzbekistan, it's very minor. So, but still we can say that if cooperation is happening in Central Asia, in these two irrigated settings, it's mostly informal. In terms of take some dilemma, yeah, we see two types of activities farmers engage. It's one is uh, making agreement among water distribution schedules. Yeah? So basically here farmers try to make arrangements. They talk to other farmers, yeah, a lot of collective efforts, they talk to design this agreement. But then when it comes to the second stage to basically to comply to this agreement, the decision making is mostly then done at individual level. So farmers don't engage in collective decision making to monitor, but mostly they prefer to, to look at the, at the performance, yeah, compliance of their other farmers individually yeah, to, to see who is doing what. So let's talk about this most important um, characteristics, which are yeah, behavioral factors, which are important uh, for decision making, which we also try to, to consider to control in, in, in our model. So let's talk about risk preference, yeah? whether farmers assess themselves as a risk taker, yeah? or time preference where farmers is uh, appreciating, valuing more benefits in future rather than now. And then, no, whether they basically value it now and then punishment for unfair behavior, whether farmers assess themselves as having very strong uh, capacity or skills to punish somebody else for unfair behavior. And then also reciprocity to return the, for instance, good behavior to others. So there we see that there is a difference between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan farmers in most of them, yeah, in the settings of Kazakhstan, probably the uh, developments are in a way that they're uh, promoting risk-taking behavior. Yeah, the farmers are more time patient. They are engaged in yeah, in the reciprocity activities. In terms of social norms, for instance, you would see that farmers basically value their participation, that they take part in social activities like hashar, for instance, traditional social activity or village meetings. You know, contribution to village work almost equally between two settings, right? both Kazakhstan and, and Uzbekistan settings have the same 88% or 90% or of farmers in Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan mentioned that it's important for them to be part of the social activities. While talking about opinions, assessing farmers' opinions about their neighbors and relatives or about farmers or about local government opinion, yeah? So how important the opinion of the three groups of actors 
you will see that in Kazakhstan, farmers put very strong, they value more, the most is opinion of their neighbors, what their neighbors think about them. And then the least is the opinion about local authorities. While it's reverse, very in Uzbekistan settings. In Uzbekistan, farmers very strongly value the opinion of local authorities and least their neighbors, yeah? So that's difference. And trust in institutions, for instance, which basically define whether farmers would be interested to continue their business or whether farmers, like in this first line, basically interested that their somebody from their family succeeds, continues their farm business. So in both settings, farmers almost share the same share of farmers, proportion of farmers mentioned that they're interested to stay in business yeah, in the long term. But in terms of functioning of institutions, yeah, in Kazakhstan, farmers are less uh, concerned yeah, that they will lose their land within the next three years compared to Uzbekistan. Yeah, almost three moderately Uzbek farmers are concerned that they will, might lose their land lease within three years. And then importance of land certificate to protect tenure rights in Kazakhstan is ex expectedly much stronger. And what is also stronger, what we can observe in Kazakhstan, also in the field that farmers value, evaluate the functioning of their water user organization, like authority in both settings, it's mostly central authority, which manages water distributions much stronger yeah, than in Uzbekistan. Yeah, trust in courts and disputes, yeah, and things related to transition process, decision-making freedom. It's also big contrast in, in Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, in Uzbekistan, uh, in, for instance, trust in courts in dispute with other farmers, both Turk, uh, farmers in Turkestan and Samarkand value, the, evaluate the same. Well, in terms of state authorities, there is a big difference. You see the farmers trust in courts that they will solve the disputes against state authorities in favor of farmers. While in Uzbekistan, it's more like in, they are not that certain, yeah? And decision-making freedom, both in, as expected in Kazakhstan, the farmers mentioned that they have very good yeah, decision-making freedom. Some farmers who engage in contract farming were not that certain they can select any crops or select any marketing channel. While in Uzbekistan, especially cotton and wheat farmers were very much concerned that the, about their uh, decision-making freedom in terms of crop choice and marketing channel. So. To reveal this determinants of behavioral factors or determinants which affect the farmer's decision to participate in give some or take some dilemmas, yeah, social problems, I, we used simple probit model, yeah, that's how it's structured. And then let's go to the pr probit results. We see here that in Kazakhstan settings, cooperation considered risky. Yeah? So, significant risky in give problem, yeah, that farmers giving, contributing to the infrastructure find it very risky, that others probably will not follow the same what they are doing and their investments will be negligible if others don't do the same. The same with time preference, farmers, it looks like that farmers tend to cooperate in a short-term problems, yeah, to solve very short-term problem, yeah, that when it, the problem appears like pump is broken, the farmers would go and contribute to it. The same with punishment for unfair cooperation, positive relationship might signal that farmers who can punish, which will have morals or behavior, which makes them possible to punish others for unfair behavior, for instance, that they contribute, that they follow water distributions schedules, agreed water distribution schedules, and others don't, they would, uh, they would be able to punish, yeah? Yeah, and yeah. Interestingly enough, we would expect, we were expecting that uh, land tenure security or land value of land certificate to protect tenure rights of a farmer would have positive effect on cooperation. In our case, it's a negative. So farmers, those farmers would trust that they're land lease certificate would stay and that would be considered against the confiscation of land, they are less likely to cooperate. Yeah. Let's think what, what it means. We're still processing this information. And yeah, talking about social norms, caring about opinion of neighbors, 
in both countries have positive effects. So when farmers want to, so those farmers like in environmental man, participation and environmental management programs, those farmers who value opinions of their neighbors and relatives quite strong, they are more likely to cooperate. While local authority, yeah, opinion about local authority gives contrasting results. In Kazakhstan, when farmers yeah, value very high, or where the value about opinion of local authority increases, the farmers are less likely to cooperate, while in Uzbekistan settings, it's in give and take dilemmas, it's positive, yeah? So farmers, those who listen to the Hakims to, or water management authority would more likely to contribute, yeah? To cooperate in water management. Yeah, trust in courts, similar to uh, land lease certificates has negative signs in Kazakhstan. So when farmers trust that courts function and can protect them against state authorities, in any disputes, they are less likely to cooperate. Yeah? In Uzbekistan, it's positive sign, especially in terms of monitoring the compliance to the uh, agreed rules. And then as expected, the water management uh, reputation or functioning of water management organization, water supply organization in both countries, it's central administration. Mostly farmers reported that the water is distributed by public administration. It has very uh, positive signal, yeah? If farmers evaluate the function of water supply organizations positive, they are more likely to co contribute, uh, they are more likely to cooperate. So in conclusion, that's a summary. What we see is the interesting things that, yeah, cooperation in Kazakhstan and partly in Uzbekistan has a properties which probably requires um, risk taking characteristics, yeah. And then also the punishment skills would also require it to, to be part of this to participate in co cooperation. In terms of in Turkestan settings or Samarkand settings, uh, we see that norms like respect to opinions of public authorities, in Kazakhstan, they promote individualism. Yeah, if, if farmers respect the authority opinions, opinions of local Akim, they more be individualistic, yeah? more independent and don't contribute to cooperation. While in Uzbekistan, that this opinion of authorities is strongly promoting cooperative behavior. Yeah? Development of formal institutions, which we measure in courts or in terms of land lease certificates, if the um, transition process goes, this institution be more crucial. This development of this formal institution can crowd out cooperation yeah, in what I mentioned, because our cooperation is measured as an informal, yeah? a large share of farmers reported that they participate voluntarily in informal, non-documented cooperation. Yeah, yeah, regulatory environment, which promotes more decision-making freedom for farmers like crop choice, yeah, could be supporting cooperative behaviors, yeah, and then also a reputation of, of water management organization can facilitate further the cooperation. So policy implication, let's talk about policy implications. That's the uh, things we came up so far. We think that it's very important for when developing any policy document related to water management, yeah, or farmers' contributions to the water management infrastructure in both settings, this water management costs, public costs are quite high. Yeah? They're comprising very large share of public budget. If the government wants to outsource this kind of budget for the voluntarily contributions of farmers, a strong reputation of the water supp supply organization is required. Yeah, that's what government should think of. And then also, of course, the reputation of those who participate in cooperation can be also important, yeah? So for instance, acknowledging pro-social behavior of farmers or farmers who basically voluntarily engage in such contributions is very important, yes? Through public recognitions in media, for instance, covering in newspaper, in TV broadcasts, yeah? That farmers can also develop a certain social status, yeah? That would, people would say, if this farmer is contributing to the water management, he's a good farmer, he's pro-social, that's our farmer, that's a behavior which we should appreciate, yeah? And then also allow farmers also to engage in different social compar comparisons, for instance, by developing certain communication uh, possibility platforms, yeah? Like we talk about farm unions here, but maybe stronger farmer associations which would 
allow farmers to learn what other farmers are doing, yeah? Yeah, whether farmers are contributing to the public good, that would be also one important mechanism to consider in policy design. So that's it, that's the literature, which you can follow. And thank you for your attention. If you have more questions, which we cannot cover here, you can write me to my email. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Nodra. Yes, so as usual, every Wednesday, I learn a ton of new things. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so I'll pass over the floor to Komjan Akramov. There are already questions coming in, so I would like to remind our viewers uh, you can use the Q&A or chat box to send your questions while we hear from our discussant. Then uh, I'll start reading your questions to the speaker. So, Komjanika, floor is yours. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm glad to be part of this uh, seminar this morning. Yeah, this morning for me, but this uh, it is afternoon for most of you. Uh, in normal times, usually I spend summer in Tashkent, in Uzbekistan, but this is not normal. Uh, I mean, at least this year is not normal. Uh, so I have to stay in Washington. And uh, so I'm glad at least I can connect with uh, my fellow countrymen and people from the region uh, virtually. So yeah, Nader, thank you very much for excellent presentation. This is very uh, thoughtful and very insightful presentation. And I have, uh, a uh, few uh, remarks and um, so first actually as you started actually until 1990s uh, economics was uh, dominated by rational expectation models so uh, we assumed that uh, economic agents are rational and they make uh, their decisions based on profit maximization or utility maximization uh, but after 1990s, with the rise of uh, behavioral economics, uh, this uh, started to change. And uh, so behavioral economics uh, contribution is uh, a more uh, psychological realistic view of human behavior entered to economics. So, people make decisions not based on the rational expectations, but based on their uh, environment, circumstance, and uh, based on their uh, preference, knowledge, and so on. And so in general, behavioral economics assumes that people satisfy rather than maximize their profit or utility. So, and so this is uh, uh, leads to bounded rational assumption. Uh, in general. So uh, we have to mention behavioral economics, although it's very uh, important uh, direction in the development economics, in general economics, but it has some limitations. And uh, also uh, in general, uh, it aims to argument and to improve, uh, but not to replace classical rational expectation models. So, uh, and coming back to the, your uh, research uh, question and the research topic, I think this is very important topic for Central Asia, and this is not the news for anybody. And uh, water is important, irrigation is very important. Without irrigation, agriculture can't be uh, functioning in Central Asia. So. I think uh, in this regard, topic is very interesting. And you mentioned a uh, few papers and of course, uh, this topic uh, needs, uh, I mean, more attention. And in this regard, uh, I think uh, this research is very uh, timely and very uh, useful. Uh, some, uh, remarks about this topic, not only this topic, but this approach. And I think uh, one of the, your conclusions uh, you mentioned, uh, so development of institutions may crowd out this uh, cooperation or something. I think that is a bit uh, problematic because in general, 
behavioral economics doesn't uh, say that uh, it doesn't uh, uh, deny the importance of institutions. Institutions are always important. Not any institutions, but the right institutions uh, are very important. In this regard, uh, water users associations or even uh, government institutions and their behavior is very important for promoting cooperation in irrigation. And uh, also sometimes actually there is uh, uh, some critique about behavioral economics uh, research. Uh, one paper by uh, Rosenweig and Christian Woodrow from Yale University, they talk about this. Uh, and so sometimes uh, this behavioral economics research dismisses real incentives and constraints that apparently lead to irrational behavior. And so this can be addressed, of course, by uh, doing better research. And here, actually, I think uh, why people uh, don't, uh, or why farmers don't cooperate, or apparently this is beneficial for farmers in, in the long term, but maybe not in the short term. That's also very important. And so this challenge can be addressed by testing specific behavior me mechanisms uh, rather than simply identifying uh, these problems. For example, some uh, such mechanisms can be present bias, how you can, uh, how the present bias or this sh short term bias uh, impacts their behavior or their decision making or self-control why farmers cannot control uh, their uh, decisions or there are some other uh, cognitive overload is very important because uh, we have limited cognitive resources a finite amount of time to make decisions farmers do the same thing and actually uh, and less than ideal willpower so this kind of uh, cognitive uh, psychological or behavioral mechanisms can be addressed more truly in the research, I think. And uh, one uh, paper by, I think, Dale Wigner uh, published it a couple of years ago, and it says actually behavioral economics can help by testing specific mechanisms where it's possible. And if you can't directly estimate, maybe you can do some calibrations. So that is another uh, suggestion. Of course, it is easy to make a suggestion, but it is difficult to implement in the real research. So my task is easier than your task here. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, the, this is, uh, I think, uh, uh, one uh, additional, uh, remark is actually about this uh, uh, survey responses by farmers. Can we trust these responses? And usually, uh, you know, farmers may have different feelings, but they don't give you that true response, but they know what I mean, uh, public expectation is about what, uh, so that, that's a very, I think, uh, important issue, not only for your research, for any research in this area. And that's, uh, I think, a uh, very important uh, factor to keep in mind. And also, uh, you have uh, most of this uh, categorical, uh, responses right uh, from one to five and how to uh, you know how you can understand this uh, difference between one and two or between three and four how do you, how we can interpret that of course this is helpful uh, for a researcher to make some uh, insightful uh, findings uh, but uh, in the real life it is a bit difficult so 
yeah, those are my uh, few remarks. And uh, in general, I think this is very interesting research and a very interesting approach uh, to this very important problem for the region. Okay, thank you, Kamjanika. Uh, so, uh, uh, Nodrake, if you could briefly respond, uh, if you if you would like, then uh, if you wish, then we'll uh, I'll read. Uh, there are some very interesting questions, so I, I'd like to take several questions from the audience as well. So, please. Thank you, Rahmat Kamjanika. Thank you, Kamjanika. Yes, you are very much right. I I will probably kind of take it as a uh, narrative story now to respond to your comments from what we have experienced yeah because of this you are right this is yeah, taking from the for instance categorical values Likert scale the self-assessment yeah that stated preferences for instance or elicited situations preferences that's we were planning to do some field experiments with farmers yeah play some games economic games to elicit their preferences and decisions. Unfortunately, yeah, we were intervened. Uh, our plans have been affected by <clears throat> by coronavirus. Yeah, that's very difficult now to conduct survey. Mobility is restrain restrained and I think there is also negative bias among farmers, even if we do interviews or play games that they will not play as an in normal year. So right now we, we have to take what we have. We were lucky that we have this <clears throat> questionnaire conducted in and also cross-country comparison. So we we take these categorical values and in uh, revealing, uh, showing this um, marginal effects, I think that can also show the direction of a unit change in this categorical value, whether it's what what direction it has, how much effect it has on a on a likelihood to cooperate. So that's what we drive. But we agree that there is better, more uh, robust, better methods to identify these behavioral factors of a farmers. Yeah, that's you're you're completely right. We 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 hope there will be a chance to to do this early next year in both settings in Kazakhstan and with Uzbekistan farmers. Another thing with in terms of um, this informal in, in effect of formalization or more integrated market institutions being developed in these two country settings that cooperation might be fading out, crowded out. That's probably the results because we mostly observe informal institutions. Yeah? So for farmers engage into the informal institutions basically to in such kind of settings, yeah? whereas the formal institutions don't work. So they in, engage in that informal cooperation. <clears throat> that might also explain, yeah. So more developing countries, uh, developing country settings, informal cooperation is more is uh, more likely to appear to occur. So in terms of uh, uh, survey responses, yes, as I said, that we, we we have to elicit, we have to check, confirm this uh, whether the stated. Um, Answers were correct. There are studies which basically compare also such two different methods, yeah, stated preferences with other methods, elicited by other methods, which basically confirms that there is some correlation. Though. So we also hope to believe that at this moment, these values can be used, yeah, we can trust to these answers. So I think that's answers to all your questions, comments. Okay, uh, so now, thank you. We have 10 minutes, so let's get to Q&A questions. So the first one is, so you mentioned two studies in irrigated agriculture in Uzbekistan in, in, in the beginning of your slide. So Rosny and Zikot, and as well as Amirova and co-authors. So how do your findings differ from those two studies? I think uh, both studies employed behavioral economics approach and studied collective action. So how do your study complements those two studies you mentioned? Briefly, if you could. Mm -hmm. um, Thank mention. you. I think we, we see it more like a complementarity to their study. So we didn't look at the trust among individuals. That we didn't have this question. The same with communication, we didn't have. But in terms of other 
factors, especially about the opinion, for instance, the social norms of valuing the opinion of others. That's I think we, we have very strong com complementarity to the study. And also we, in terms of a reputation of organization, our studies also confirms and basically adds additional to the study of Ahmad Hamidov who worked on that uh, uh, kind of leadership in the water user associations. Here we say that the water management organization's reputation is very important to, an or, uh, to informally organize to, to the voluntarily contributions, yeah? Where people don't assign themselves to any water user association, but basically still contribute. So that's, we say, that's additional complementarity to this study. So that was my answer. Okay, thank you. So uh, <laughs> there are a couple of questions on the choice of farmers between Samarkand and Turkestan, and how comparable are these two groups of farmers. So, uh, for example, the question is, uh, uh, so from uh, Iroda and related questions to this is, uh, can you compare the context uh, when you compare these two groups of farmers? For example, uh, in Kazakhstan, uh, authority does not have a huge leverage when they talk to farmers, but in Uzbekistan, authorities may have that leverage to mobilize uh, farmers for different uh, purposes. So uh, how is it possible to in integrate the context to your interpretation of your findings? Mm -hmm. So yeah. related question to this is, um, who should the farmers trust? Their Hakim or their neighbor farmer? So who has a more trustworthy and valuable answers. Okay, yeah. Thanks, thanks to the audience, to Iroda, for a wonderful question. We were in the process of digesting the results and of the making sense. And exactly this is leveraging, yeah, in terms of control of water management or decision making of a farmer by central authority that shows our our model results show this difference, yeah, that where farmers basically, the, in Kazakhstan settings, the results show that um, farmers who trust the opinion of the local authority, who value the opinion of local authority, try to go individual way. They don't cooperate, yeah? They, they don't value this, they don't engage in this cooperation. While in Uzbekistan, this leveraging and also probably that the government engages into the, in the activities of farmers, has a big role that the farmers, those who, who value opinion of the, about themselves from local Hakim authority, basically tend to cooperate, yeah? So in the, if the vision of Hakim would be that farmers have to cooperate and then he would value those farmers who are cooperating, then in Uzbekistan, the cooperation can be easily promoted. Yeah, that's, I would say, probably the answer. And then the second one was in relationship with how this um, um, okay. was it about punishment or no uh, it's uh, who should you trust your neighbor ah. or your hockey yeah i think that's uh, also answers yeah, this question I think you answered briefly um, yeah. so let me get to the next question uh, can you clarify why water water management is considered as a public good Mm -hmm. uh, and is, it's it's still possible because uh, the person says it's still possible to exclude it from consumption and its rival. Uh, and another comment is attitudes of individuals uh, such as trust might be very endogenous. Uh, often they're considered as dependent variables. So did you consider any type of cluster analysis to identify similar uh, or different groups based on preferences and attitudes in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. And if you do that, how your conclusions might change. Okay, so with the second one in, in terms of trust, I would say that that's a good point to consider, yeah, that the trust is endogenous. That's what we have to, to check, yeah, whether trust varies with certain uh, properties of area or, area or or, or functioning of institutions. In terms of the public good, uh, why we consider it as a, uh, this as a public good game, we would say that 
with this public good or give some dilemma, yeah, this is social fence problem, that we say that there is a possibility that farmers' investments into irrig that irrigation infrastructure is massive, yeah? So it's basically, we talk about irrigation infrastructure here, which serves to the, pro uh, to the benefits of all other non uh, contributors, yeah? Those people who don't decide, it's very difficult to exclude them from this settings and they're basically can include different farmers who don't compare but, but also households who are difficult to reach yeah probably their members are migrated they're living in some urban settings but the the family members don't participate but they basically received the water from these irrigation canals where the farmers invest yeah they contribute repair these canals so that's okay um uh, so, and uh, the next question is maybe last question. Uh, so it's very important to observe uh, behavior changes and what drives those behavior changes over time. So, and you mentioned there are lots of reforms in Uzbekistan uh, right now, especially in agriculture sector. So when you compare Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan farmers, so what do you think will drive uh, behavior change in those farmers, especially when they design uh, different policies? What should policymakers pay attention to? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Wonderful question, interesting. That's, yeah, that's a, a reason for comparative study. We say that, yeah, if we take more the uh, economy settings, with more developed market institutions, yeah, stronger uh, land lease, uh, land tenure rights, um, uh, more trust in functioning of courts, and then more institutions which promote individ in individualism, uh, market institutions, then we would say that the changes might also imply that the garments, this changes the direction towards uh, behavioral traits among Uzbek farmers towards Kazakhstan farmers, for instance, that was, when we say that they would start converging, moving that direction, they would say that very strong, important, uh, probably implication would be that the reputation of public authorities, of administration, local administration, administration relate, related to water management or directly to agriculture should be improved. Yeah, that's one thing to, to work on that it should be improved and also kind of decision-making freedom, the freedom to choose crop or marketing channel is also important. That's where uh, should be more efforts been done, yeah? So how to make sure that the farmers are not uh, directly linked to certain organizations or policy plans, but can also make a choice, yeah? And how to affect these choices in terms of crops, in terms of what to produce, how much to produce, where to sell. So I would say that reputation is important of public organization, but also this uh, working more on um, reforms directed to more decision-making freedom of, of farmers in Uzbekistan. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I wish I have more questions, but we're constrained by time. So I would like to thank our speakers and our discussion very much for uh, their time and wonderful presentation and comments. So I would like to remind our viewers, we hope to see you next Wednesday at the same time. Uh, our speaker will be Dr. Suresh Babu from IFPRI with his topic on structural transformation uh, in agriculture using evidence from India. So uh, thank you very much. And we'll upload everything uh, on our website, conference.wiut.uz. And I would like once more thank our uh, organizers, Ifpri and Iyamo, who are on your screen uh, this morning again. And hope to see you, everyone, next Wednesday. Stay safe. And thanks very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.